Let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this evening to thank you once again for the salvation that we have through Jesus Christ, the work of the cross, Lord, with Jesus Christ left behind the heavens and the glory, Lord, in which he operated and existed and through whom, Lord, he created us and came to this world, Lord, as one of us, Lord, to be able to experience and endure, Lord, all the things that we experience and endure and to remain faithful, Lord, sinless, and one day, Lord, take our place on the cross and take our place, Lord, and shed his precious blood for our sin. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, because that sacrifice for us, Lord, was accepted by you. And we know that, Lord, because today we worship a risen Saviour. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the opportunity you give us this evening to be able to come together and to worship you, Lord, through song and through prayer and through the study of your word. And we ask, Heavenly Father, that you open our hearts and minds to hear, Lord, the words that you have for us tonight, that each of us, Lord, may be drawn closer and nearer, Lord, to the wonderful love and grace, Lord, that you have for each of us, and to understand, Lord, your wonderful plans for our lives, not focusing, Lord, so much on this life, but for the eternal glory, Lord, that awaits us all. And for those who couldn't be with us, Lord, we ask that you provide their portion as well. And all these things we pray for in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> I'd like us this evening to open up our Bibles to Matthew chapter 13. And there's a number of parables here, and I'll refer to them all, but I'm just going to read from verse 47 to verse 52. The parable of the dragnet. It's the last parable in this chapter, a series of seven parables, um, and uh, as a summary for the chapter. Matthew 13, verse 47 to 52. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea, gathered some of every kind, which when it was full they drew to shore. And they sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but threw the bad away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just, and cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Jesus said to them, Have you understood all these things? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he said to them, Therefore, every scribe instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out his treasures, his treasure, things new and old. In this chapter, Jesus Christ refers to, he presents to us seven parables, and most of them have a target or a focus on the kingdom of heaven. Now, the kingdom of heaven is a very specific title in the Bible. It runs, it encompasses, as if we have to read the whole chapter, it encompasses both those who are. Uh, genuine believers of the word of God and those who aren't. And that's why early on there's the parable of uh, the wheat and the tares. Uh, Lord, you planted good seed, but you know, where do these tares come from? Uh, an evil man came during the night and planted the, uh, the tares. And do you want us to rip it out? No, leave them, just in case you uh, hurt the wheat, damage the wheat. At the end of time, I will remove the tares. Uh, and here, the drag, parable of the dragnet, the kingdom of heaven again is like a dragnet. It catches in good fish and bad fish. And at some point in time, there'll be a separation of the good fish and the bad fish. So the, this expression, the kingdom of heaven, doesn't represent only true believers, which is what we would think of, of today, but it encompasses all those who come near the gospel, the uh, gospel message, for whatever their motivation is, whatever their reason is. Some because they're genuine believers, others because... Uh, they're interested, they like what they hear, they know this is the truth and so they're scared to walk away from it. Or they may have some other vested interests, you know, you can trust these people, you can have good company with these people, they won't take advantage of you, and all the other things that come, that come with uh, the thinking of what a Christian is today. But the kingdom of heaven here encompasses a lot more than that. It encompasses those who are genuine in their faith and those who aren't sure but are hangers-on uh, and are just gathered to where the gospel is. And Jesus Christ speaks and says these seven parables about the kingdom of heaven. A parable is a story uh, in Greek, uh, it's a story that's cast along the side of 
a truth that you want to explain to people. Uh, they may want to uh, emphasize or elucidate, make it a lot clearer. And so you say a story that captures <clears throat> the main essence of the truth that you want to present. And so the truth is presented in a story uh, so people can relate to it. And it re also enables the hearer to walk away and instead of trying to remember all these distinct points that you're making in a sermon, as we often do, he remembers a story and the story brings to mind, to memory, all the things that relate to that story and what the application is. And the parable also, all the parables that are in the Bible, enable the hearer to ponder, to stop and think, and ask themselves, how does this apply in my life? And because it's not often explained how it applies in our lives, uh, it, it, um, it confronts us with the thinking and the wrestling that we have sometimes with God's word to try and work out how does this apply in my life. And two people read the same parable and sometimes the application may be a little different for each person because you know, whatever it is in their life that God wants to touch may be different. And so it enables the hearer to ponder and to study the application of what Jesus Christ is trying to say, what the word of God is trying to say. A, a Welsh theologian over 100 years ago, C.H. Dodd, said, a parable is a metaphor or scene drawn from nature or common life, making the hearer stop because of its vividness and strange or strangeness, and leaving the mind in sufficient doubt about its application to tease it into active thought. In other words, it doesn't let you rest. You, know, you play it over in your mind. It sort of teases out your thinking to try and understand how does this apply in my life. So Jesus Christ always used parables, and he uses parables because he wants to challenge our thinking. He wants to challenge our mind into action. Uh, we wrestle with his word because his word calls us to make various decisions about things in our lives. Uh, it prompts the hearer, parables often prompt the hearer, uh, to assess their heart and to think about you know, how this parable that they're reading may apply in their lives. And as I said before, parables have usually have one major point. You, know, you don't build the whole body of theology on parable. It's a story with one main point that Jesus Christ is trying to make and uh, we shouldn't build a lot of theology on the story uh, because sometimes the details given the story aren't the main focus. The main focus is the main point that Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is trying to make. And so parables aren't simply to convey information. You convey information, you write a list of things, you uh, write an essay, you give it to someone and you convey information to them. You give them a manual and you convey information. Jesus spoke parables to bring people's hearts to a point of questioning. And he did that because his desire was and remains that each one of us comes to an understanding of the truth of the gospel and of the various truths he has in his word. He wants there to be no ambiguity in these truths. And so he hasn't written it, uh, all of it, in a way that you have to be a theologian or someone very sophisticated with a lot of reading to understand what he says in his word. He's written it in a way that even the simplest person can understand it. The parables we have in this chapter are all an invitation to listen, an invitation to engage with a few issues that Jesus Christ has for us. Now, the subject of all these parables, as we said, is the kingdom of heaven. Uh, so it's open to all of us, not just uh, true believers. And today we can liken the kingdom of heaven to a church where believers and non-believers get together for various reasons, a mixed collection of people. Christians and maybe some sympathizers, some curious people, and even some people who are not sure if they want to be here. Um, but for Jesus Christ, being close enough is not good enough. For Jesus Christ, these parables were to challenge everyone, those who walked with him or walked in the truth of what they believe God's word said, and those who were distant. It was there to challenge all of them. And in, his invitation was not simply to gather more information and knowledge. His invitation was that each of us can become part of the body of Christ, the church, the true church, past, present and future, and one day meet him as our Lord and Saviour and not as our judge. That was uh, what he wanted to achieve through the work that he began and his apostles continued and the church continues today to spread the gospel message so people don't become religious but become children of God. There's enough religion and it doesn't necessarily help people but become a child of God with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is what helps us draw closer to God and draw closer to one another. And so the first parable we have in chapter 13 is the parable of the sower. Uh, we know the parable. The seed was thrown in all directions. 
didn't discriminate what sort of ground it was uh, in the interpretation that Jesus Christ gives, didn't discriminate what sort of heart it was, whether it was a soft heart, ready to accept the seed, the word of God, or a hardened heart that was trodden and no seed could take root and everything in between. It didn't discriminate uh, between any of the soils. Some hearts, soft, allowed the seed to take root and to grow and produce fruit, uh, some 30, some 50, 60, and some 100 fold. Others hard, nothing took root, and others allowed the seed to take root, uh, but they withered away, or as Jesus Christ says, the cares of this world choked the seed. Uh, but blessed are those who remain faithful to the end and allow God's word to be fruitful in their lives. Now, this is a nice parable. Uh, I'm sure we've heard many sermons about this parable, and I don't tend to spend a lot of time on tonight. But this parable prompts the questions from the disciples in verse 10. And the question is, why do you speak to them in parables? So in this question, we assume they understood what the parable was about, even though Jesus Christ goes on to explain. But why do you speak to them? Uh, we get it, Lord. We, we, we're okay. We've been with you for a long time. We understand what your purpose is and what you're trying to achieve. Uh, we, we understand all this. But you can, you can really make it a lot simpler. You, know, they, you, can make it, you can explain it a lot simpler so that people can understand. Why do you speak to them in parables? Yeah, that's the essence of their question. Why do you speak to them in parables? Nice story, but you know, just make it simpler. And that's not so much a problem, but the answer to Jesus Christ has created a problem for centuries. And the answer that Jesus Christ gives in verse 11 is that, and a lot of people make a big deal about this answer, he answered and said to them, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. And so often this verse will be used, along with a lot of other verses, to say, uh, does this mean that God has chosen that some will believe and understand and understand God's grace and therefore become children of God and others, it hasn't been given to them, therefore they won't understand, they won't believe and won't become children of God. And tonight we're not going to solve this debate that's been raising for the last who knows how many hundreds of years. But we have to deal with this question in passing in order to understand what the parables in this chapter say to us, and in particular the parable of the dragnet. All the parables, but this uh, parable in particular. We have to deal with this issue in order to understand the parable. So what is this mystery here? Uh, the mystery is here that Jesus Christ says, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but not the others. What, was the, what were the mysteries? Now, there's a number of references in the Old and the New Testament, but in particular the New Testament, which talk about the mystery which was once hidden from man's eyes, but now revealed through the prophets and through the apostles and through Jesus Christ. I've just chosen a couple of verses from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, where, G where the Apostle Paul clearly spells out that the mystery that he's referring to, that Jesus Christ may have been referring to here, and is often referred to in the, um, in the New Testament, is in fact the church. And he says in Ephesians 3, verses 5 and 6, of the church, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has been made as it now has been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body, partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. So the Jews had the history which said they were the chosen people and everyone else was a Gentile. Uh, no room for them in God's plans. And the New Testament comes along to tell us, well, now there is a plan of salvation for the Jews and it's not just uh, for uh, those, sorry, there's now a plan of salvation for the Gentiles. God is not for just for the Jews, it's for anyone that would come to him and believe in him and become part of the body of Christ, which was quite confronting for the Israelites. But this thing that was a mystery, not secret, as some Bible versions will say, but a mystery not clear, not understood, not seen, now has, become, has been revealed, revealed to the disciples to know and understand that salvation is through Jesus Christ, that they can become part of the body of Christ through Jesus Christ, and that salvation is only found through Jesus Christ. And through this um, saving work of the, of the cross, each of us who were once distant from God now can become not only his children, but know that we have a heavenly home being prepared for us. And Jesus Christ is saying here that some people's hearts are sensitive and they see and know and understand what it is that they're hearing when they hear this truth being spoken. 
and others of a hearts are hardened. They can't see, and even though they hear the words, they cannot hear the message. And the question is why? Why do some people have soft hearts and other people have hard hearts? And the answer again is given by Jesus Christ in verse 15, where he says, Their hearts have grown dull and their ears are hard of hearing. They have closed their eyes. So the responsibility, Jesus Christ says, for this hardness of heart versus a soft heart rests entirely with the individual. Fairly and squarely with the individual, they have closed their eyes. Every opportunity they've been given to hear, they have shut their ears. Their hearts have become hardened because they've kept resisting the conviction of the Holy Spirit to wake up and come to their senses and understand they need to be saved from this perverse generation as the apostles often preached and we read about in Acts. So Jesus puts a responsibility fairly and squarely on the individual and he reveals, or the parables rather reveal, uh, that some people have a desire to see and understand and when they hear it, they, they open their hearts and they, they're receptive to the word of God. And he spoke parables so that those who had open hearts, soft hearts, ready to listen, ready to understand, would accept and wouldn't further harden their hearts. And he also spoke in parables, because it says elsewhere, they listen, they can't hear, so that they wouldn't further harden their hearts if their hearts were already hardened. He, he was showing grace towards them in that they would just hear a story without understanding what the connection was to themselves, whereas those with soft hearts would not only hear a story, but would, see, it would hear and understand what he was trying to tell them about their lives, about their relationship with God. So why do some people's hearts remain hardened to the gospel? That's really the question. The, word, uh, the world, rather, uh, in this chapter, were presented with the world being the canvas in which the Lord is doing his work, seeking to save the lost, and all the parables have an essence of that in them. In uh, Second Peter, well-known verse, chapter 3, verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Well, the Lord is not slack. He's not taking his time uh, and putting up with everything around us because he's slack. He's seeing what's happening in the world around us, He's not slack, but he doesn't want, he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So he gives us an understanding that the Lord doesn't want anyone to have a hard heart. He wants every person to come to repentance. And he tells us he came to seek and to save the lost. Now he also tells us no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. So we see there, there's a partnership between Jesus Christ and God the Father. The parables are spoken, the invitation is made through the seed and through the other parables. And he says, but no one can come to me unless the Father draws them. That's in John 6, 44. A bit later on in John, chapter 12, verse 32, he says, and I, if I be lifted up from earth, will draw all men to me. So until Jesus Christ ascended from our world, died and was resurrected and ascended to the heavens, the Father drew people to Jesus Christ. But Jesus Christ says, after I'm lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to me. That is not, he's not going to discriminate based on what you and I or others may think. And in fact, uh, he says in the famous verses, John 3:16, a bit earlier, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world, and we know the last verse. So what Jesus Christ is telling us is he had to die and to be lifted up, but once he was lifted up, he would draw all men to him. And whoever believed in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So this all makes sense. God doesn't discriminate, but he can't change man's heart. So what is it that softens a man's heart in one situation and maybe not in another? And Jesus Christ again comes along to tell us that this drawing work towards him is the work of the Holy Spirit. Sorry, the work of the Holy Spirit. John 16, verses 8 and 11, to 11, he says, And when he, this is the Holy Spirit, has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. So there has to be a work of the Holy Spirit in a man's heart. There has to be a response in the man's heart to understand the invitation of Jesus Christ towards him. 
And there has to be a willingness of man to come to him and acknowledge I am a sinner in need of salvation because the Holy Spirit begins with convicting man about sin. About righteousness, that if he stands before God with his own righteousness, he's destined for eternal hell. hell. Because our righteousness, the Bible tells us, is like a filthy rag. And also about judgment. The judgment awaits those who stand before God in their own righteousness and not with the righteousness that comes from giving our lives to Jesus Christ. It's the Holy Spirit that does that. And all of this is to bring us to the point, the central point of the gospel, which is the gospel is for everyone. And that's why in the parables we see the world as the scene that he's working in, the backdrop that he's working in, but not everyone comes to him. And some people's hearts are hardened. And he says, if you have ears to hear, him who has ears to hear, let him hear. We all have ears. But sometimes our ears don't connect with that inner part in our hearts where the Holy Spirit's doing its work, trying to convict us and help us understand of our sinfulness before God. And for Paul, who was an apostle to the nations, it was a very simple equation for him. He saw no barriers to anyone receiving Jesus Christ. And he said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God's salvation for everyone who believes, first the Jew and also for the Greeks. Yet despite all this, we know that not everyone's going to be saved. Um, Jesus, the apostle, rather, writes in Hebrews uh, about the Lord. Today, if you hear the voice of the Lord, do not harden your hearts. Jesus Christ says himself, when I return, will I find the faith? So despite all this work that's happening, that's not targeted to one specific group of people or per type of person, but targets everyone. The gospel message to everyone. It's not biased. We're biased. God is not biased. We all see that the world around us isn't moving the direction that shows that God's will is being done. It's moving in a different direction. Because while the Holy Spirit is doing this work and working through us, and working in man's heart to convict them of sin, of righteousness and of judgment. There's another influencer. I shouldn't put the Holy Spirit and the other influencer in the same sentence. But there's another person out there, another being out there, an evil influencer, who's doing the opposite work. And we find this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. But even if our gospel is veiled, it's, it's hidden, it's shielded, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of, God, of gospel, the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. And so what we have coming together is the Holy Spirit convicting on one side, the devil on the other side blinding people, the spirit of this age blinding people who resist, who do not want to believe, and their hearts get continually harder. And that explains why the response to the gospel message isn't simply a matter of information. If they only understood, well, sometimes they can. But their heart has been hardened sometimes because they've resisted the conviction of the Holy Spirit and the devil has come along to harden their hearts and to blind them. And that's why it's so important when we feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit, not just about sin in our lives, but for anything in our lives, to have an open heart and to listen to what the Holy Spirit is convicting us about. Not to resist, because in resisting our heart, in that area at least of our lives, may go hard, may, may be hardened. We need to have soft and supple hearts that the Holy Spirit can, sp can speak to, open hearts to accept what God is trying to say to us, because he wants us to grow in our walk with him. And the parable of the sower, uh, the parable of the sower highlights this point. You know, the receptive hearts accept uh, some for longer, some for shorter, and some forever. And, um, and they, they produce fruit, and that's how God wants us to be in our lives too. Allow his word to be fruitful in our lives and for our lives to be transformed by him uh, as, the day, as the days get darker. After the, gospel, the parable of the sower, we have another uh, three parables which really talk about on one hand, you know, the purity of the word of God and what he wants to do in our lives, the church, build his church up. We have another three parables that follow which really talk about the corruption that the devil tries to do uh, in this work that God is trying to do in the church. And so the next parable he gives us is a wheat of the tares. 
Lord, you planted good seed. Where did this bad seed come from? Uh, well, while we were sleeping, an evil, evil men came and they planted this seed. Lord, you want us to rip it out? No, no, don't do that because you might damage the wheat. At the end of time, time of judgment, I will gather the wheat and the, throw the tares uh, into the fire. So the Lord is patient. We sometimes aren't patient with one another, with those around us, but the Lord is patient. Uh, and as much as we'd like to deal with some things in our church life, in our church community right away, uh, the Lord is sometimes is a bit more patient than us and he waits for judgment day. And the warning here for us is that just because the Lord is tolerant of what's happening around us and sometimes among us, that doesn't mean he accepts it. And there will come a time of separation where he will separate the wheat from the tares. And that's why we need to have supple hearts. Just because we're coming to church, just because we read God's word on occasions and maybe pray, that doesn't mean our hearts are often uh, always soft and supple before God. We need to have soft hearts that listen to the word of God. Then we have the parable of the mustard seed. Uh, the emphasis on this tiny seed that grows into a large tree. And a lot of people have interpreted this as you know, the kingdom of heaven growing and how big it is and even the birds of the air find, uh, find uh, refuge in this large tree. But what the word of God here is trying to tell us as he groups it together uh, with the tares, that this parable is not so much about how big and wonderful this tree is and that birds can find refuge in there, but how comfortable sometimes established religion becomes for people that really aren't connected, truly connected with God. The birds here aren't necessarily, uh, well, in my view, they're unbelievers. People who are, hang are hangers-on, they find refuge in the church. And a lot of established religions do that, in nesting in its branches. But as we've seen, a time of reckoning, a time of judgment is going to come where God is going to separate those who are his from those who aren't his. And you go on to the parable of the leaven. And many see this parable about the spread of the influence of God's, of the gospel message in the world, how it's going to permeate the whole world and transform the whole world and all those things. And the church will grow and influence all the world. Well, I'm not seeing a lot of, of that happening today. And we can point the finger as various reasons why it's not happening today. But what I'm saying is, in fact, the opposite. And if we go through God's word, every reference to leaven is uh, always, almost always negative reference uh, to leaven. For the Jews, leaven was associated with impurity and corruption, and the thought of some leaven hidden in flour to them was uh, offensive to their way of thinking. Uh, and so the picture here is presented of this tiny bit of leaven hidden in a massive amount of flour uh, and it, it makes the whole batch of dough rise. Jesus here is saying that, uh, in my view, that the word of God does build up, uh, the, it creates the church, builds the church. But a little bit of yeast can get in there and make the whole thing rise. And why it's rising is not because of the word of God. In Matthew 16, 6, Jesus Christ said, take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sudacees. Take care. Take heed, beware of the leaving of the Pharisees and the Sudacees. And maybe what I'm saying is the church, as it grows, there'll be things that'll come in and swell people with pride and swell people for all sorts of other reasons and not because of the gospel. And we need to be careful of that. Uh, the next two parables that we have here, before we get to the parable of the dragnet, uh, are often used to describe people coming to Jesus Christ. The man finds and hides a treasure and sells all that he has to buy the field. When you think about that, uh, you, know, you start scratching the surface of that sort of uh, idea in this parable, it, it creates a problem for us because man really has nothing to offer Jesus Christ to buy anything from Jesus Christ. And even if he did, Jesus Christ is not for sale and salvation is not for sale. Um, and so, you know, what are we suggesting here that we're gonna buy him and hide him somewhere? It goes contrary to everything else that the Bible tells us. So if we believe in Jesus Christ, we're to be vocal, we're to be part of the Great Commission to the world around us. But from God's perspective, this parable makes a lot of sense. You know, we always look at it from our perspective, but from God's perspective, it makes a lot of sense. Because Jesus Christ came. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And we're told that Jesus Christ has purchased us for a price. 
God gave his own son to purchase a salvation for us. It's not so much us finding a treasure uh, and hiding it and burying it and buying a field, as much as it's Jesus Christ coming, you know, the ultimate payment from God, because he saw in us eternal beings created in the image of Jesus Christ, and he came, and when it says hide here, in Greek the word can also mean kept safe, secure, to keep us safe and secure until the day that Jesus Christ returns to take us to be with him in eternity. The second pearl, uh, the second of these two last, the second last parable, the man discovers a pearl of great price and sells all to buy it. Again, from a human perspective, we would say that the pearl of great price and many great sermons and tracts have been written about the pearl of great price have about man should give everything to obtain for himself what Jesus Christ have, and not take anything away from that. But again, if you scratch the surface, what is it that we can buy from God? We can buy from Jesus Christ. How can we buy anything from him? We as broken human beings. What's for sale? And so from God's perspective, however, this parable says a lot. Because the parable says in verse... Sorry, I'll find it in a moment. And in the previous parable as well, sorry. Uh, it says, uh, for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has. And here it says, when he has found one pearl of great price, he went and sold all that he had and he bought it. Now from God's perspective, there's, you know, there's a very interesting perspective here in that God saw the value of man's soul. He created it in the image of his son, created man in the image of his son, didn't want the death of the sinner. And for the joy here it says, he goes and sells everything that he has to buy, that field, the pearl. In Hebrews 12, 2, we read, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And so we see Jesus gave everything to purchase a valuable treasure. We often don't see ourselves as a, tre as a treasure. But in the Old Testament, Israel was the treasure. In the New Testament, uh, we see how valuable we are in the eyes of Jesus Christ. It was Jesus Christ who gave up everything for man in Philippians 2, verses 5 to 8. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient to the point of death, even death of the cross. So he left everything behind to die in your place and my place. And that's the value he places on each of us. And we see it again when, God said, when Jesus Christ says, For God so loved the world. We're precious in his eyes. We're precious in his sight and his eyes. And it points to how much Jesus Christ loves man's soul and, and the warning that Jesus Christ gives here for all these parables, well, a lot of the parables is, Whoever has ears, let him hear. Let, let him open his ears and understand. And we come to the final parable, the dragon dead, which is the one we started with tonight. Spread out across the water, waited on the bottom, and the, ropes, uh, the boats take it out and they drag it to shore. And once on shore, the fish are inspected, the good are put into vessels for keeping, and the bad fish are thrown out. They're separated. The fish for eating is saved, the rest are discarded. Uh, what does this parable mean when it says the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet? It means that the kingdom of heaven gathers everyone in. The gospel gathers a lot of people in. And some of us come and we come because we understand the gospel message and we give our house to Jesus Christ, receive forgiveness from him, repent of our sin, receive forgiveness from him and become children of God. Others are drawn in because they know it's the truth and they're too scared to walk away from it. I was a bit like that when I was younger, too scared to turn my back on God because I knew he was there and not willing enough to believe in him because uh, at that point in time I didn't think I was that bad. And some people are like that. Others are drawn for other reasons. The different reasons that everyone's drawn uh, is not our concern tonight. The point of the parable is that everyone is to search their own heart, not to doubt their salvation. Not one minute to say, am I saved or aren't I saved? That's not the point here that Jesus Christ is trying to make. 
But what he's trying to make is sometimes we can fall into a spiritual rut and just go through the motions of what it means to be a, a religious person, a Christian, and not open our ears. We allow our ears to be dull, our hearts to be hard, and not open our ears to what the Lord has to say. In Hebrews 12, 15, it says, Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness bring up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. There are things that can draw us away from Jesus Christ. Now, fortunately, there are things that sometimes we pay more attention to than the saving message of the gospel. And there's things in our lives that can take us away. Now, Timothy talks about, Paul says to Timothy about, I remember the guy's name, he was shipwrecked. You know, sailing on the high seas, he lost his way. He was shipwrecked somewhere never to return. And that can become one of us if we're not careful if we allow our ears to become dull and our eyes blinded, because that's what the enemy wants. So tonight, I want us to think about the gospel message. Most of us, I believe, who are born-again Christians, have given their hearts to Jesus Christ, know that we're children of God. Let's, not, let's be careful not to fall into a rut with our thinking and say, it's all good, I'm all doing well. But let's allow God's word to challenge us in our thinking, our daily walk with him, to understand more about God, and what he expects of us as his children, and how he's given us Jesus Christ as our Lord and Saviour. And as Paul says, is there anything he won't give us if he's given us Jesus Christ as our Lord and Saviour? Is there anything he can't give us? There isn't. But sometimes if we don't open our eyes and open our ears and allow our hearts to be dulled, we can't see the glory that awaits us and the power that Jesus Christ can give us not to do all the miracles that sometimes capture people's imaginations, but to be a light in a world of darkness that desperately needs to see Jesus Christ. I want us to think about those words tonight. The gospel message is for each of us. Not just at the point where we became a child of God, but it continues every day in our lives, prompting us to think about how we're walking and how we're dealing with various things and not to fall into a rut, but every day, a new day with new challenges to commit it to the Lord and allow him to work in our lives. May God bless his word in our hearts. I'll just close with a prayer and then we'll have a song afterwards. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord, to thank you once again in Jesus' name for your mercy and your grace. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the invitation to join you, Lord, in eternal glory. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, that that doesn't depend on our abilities it doesn't depend Lord on our skills but it's so dependent on the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross we thank you Heavenly Father for your word and how it prompts us to constantly look to Jesus not to be sidetracked Lord by so many noises that exist in the world around us and we pray Heavenly Father that you help us truly focus on your word and allow you Lord to deal with our hearts for our ears to be always open, Lord, and our eyes always to be open, and our hearts always soft, Lord, to receive your conviction, your word, and to allow you to deal with us, Lord, in the way that will prepare us more and more for eternity. We thank you, Lord, for the time that we are together, and we ask for your blessing upon us. These things we pray.